Hello and welcome to Objective-C programming course. This is lecture number eight. And in this lecture, we're going to cover archiving and saving and loading your data into a file. So you have this application we were working on. Uh, it's that simple table view application with two columns. And last time we have added undo and redo capabilities and that's kind of cool, but we still limited by the lifespan of this application and once we close the application we lose all the data and most of the time especially if you are doing and if you are making a document-based application but still in most of the cases you want to save files so that you can load them later or move those files or copy those files send those files to someone and work with the same file uh, using the another instance of your application. So in this lecture, we're going to cover everything we need to save and load data into a file. But before we go, go on to actually saving and loading, we have to understand the simple idea of archiving. So you have an object, and object is purely programming, uh, programmatical concept because when you think of an object, you think of source code, you think of an implementation of a class you have. But when you run your application, if you just take a look into your application executable, uh, you will see something unreadable. That's because your program is compiled into actual bytecode or some format uh, which is executable for, by your operating system. And none of that source code is there. You, you won't see your names of variables and the data you were working with and all those classes. That source code is lost, but you still have the data, of course. You still have all the functionality. Now, if you want to save your object somehow, one of the ways you could do it inside the source code is, well, save the source code in, in some form. And if you were working with JavaScript a lot, you probably know about JSON. It's a format of saving your objects as a text. And it comes really handy because if you have a computer and you created some object in your browser, let's say it's still JavaScript, and you want another computer to get the same object, you could just convert this object into a string sort of like a textual description of the object and send this string, which is just a simple string. There's nothing to it. it it's not an object by then. It's just number of characters. Send this number of characters to another computer and then convert it back into an object because it has everything you need. It has the names of the variables and values of those variables. So we can create an object from a string. A similar idea, but not that nice because you won't see strings, is serialization into bytes. And if you're coming from Java world, if you were doing serialization in Java, you know what I'm talking about. If no, then this is still simple. You probably read the whole slide while I was talking. So idea is simple. You have an object and you just convert this object into bytes. You do it in such a way, following some format, so that some other time you can convert it back into an object and get this object and work with this object. You can send this series of bytes over the network, but the most wonderful part is it's a series of bytes, meaning if you sending it, let's say, over the network, then the other side of the receiver starts receiving these things, these bytes, and by the time you finish receiving, he has everything he needs. So he can kind of start working on the information he gets. And this series could be big or small, but he gets something every second or something like this. But don't think about this now. Just think of archiving is a way of converting your object into bytes. So if you convert an object into bytes, you also have to convert everything you have inside the object. 
And since we have this wonderful object-oriented stuff, we could have a lot of objects inside another object and uh, stuff like that. So you need to convert everything inside there. The class we will be using, and yes, of course, well, if this is a task, we already have something for this task. So we don't have to worry about serialization or archiving in the most fundamental way. We have everything we need in uh, the Objective-C libraries. So another class from NS Wonderful World is NS Coding. In this is not actually a class. This this is an abstract class. But the thing is, we have to implement uh, two methods in our application if we want our object to be able uh, to archive and unarchive. So. One method is init with coder, and it takes a coder, which is that series of bytes. It reads the data from the coder and saves it into your instant variables. So if you have a series of bytes, you have to write the method to convert the series of bytes into your object. In other words, get all those variables and write the values of those variables inside you inside the object. And the other way is, of course, encode your variables. So if you are an object, you should be able to encode yourself all your inside variables into series of bytes. In other words, into a coder. So we won't see the uh, instances of this class anywhere because this is an abstract class. So we won't be able to create uh, variables or instances of this class, but we don't have to. So to encode something, we need to uh, implement this function. So if we want to encode an object, we are going to call this method, encode object for key. The main thing here is the key. If we are encoding some object, we are converting it into a series of bytes. And inside that series of bytes, if you just look inside a series of bytes, it's just ones and zeros. You won't be able to distinguish between which part is your object. So you need to have some key so that when you load, you load that object and you specify the key that represents your object. It's just like a, um, a dictionary. So if you call this method and you pass it an object which you want to encode, that object should implement those two methods. But at least that first one, init. Uh, I'm sorry, encode because we are encoding. So the second method should be implemented. It will be called and the object will be converted into a series of bytes and then be kind of saved in the series with this key, a key. And the key is just a string, just like uh, with the key value encoding. Uh, this is just a string key. If we want to encode primitive values, like a boolean or double, we have those methods as well. It's encode bool, encode double, etc. for a key, and it's it's the same idea. They already have uh, the way of encoding, so we of course don't have to write anything. We can just use it right away. So let's just take a look at our application and add the encoding capabilities to our person class. So let me go back to my Xcode and I have this application I called it remover because, well, I don't know, I, I was thinking about removing people, not adding them. 
Okay. So just to remind you, this is that application with the with people and expected race, etc. So I want to be able to encode my uh, person. And if I'm going to do so, I have to tell the compiler that I am going to adopt the NS coding protocol. So this is that protocol that I just showed you that tells us I have to implement two methods. So I'm adding to my header file of person the NS coding protocol. So now if I go to person, it should start saying incomplete implementation. Is that because I don't have those two methods implemented? So let's implement it. First is encode with coder. So that method doesn't return anything. Of course, Xcode tries to autocomplete, so I have this thing. So now I have to specify what parts of my, my object I want to encode. Because, well, sometimes we have a lot of data, but the data that actually matters that we want to encode might be just part of that data. In our case, only data we have is the name and expected race, and both of them are important, so I want to encode and save both of them. So I will call, make two calls. So the coder I'm using is here. So let's say a coder encode object. And my object is a string, the NS string, the name. I'm not using a primitive uh, encoding because I'm saving a string, and string is an object, it's not a primitive type. So I have the name, and the key I'm going to use is, of course, the same. And I'm going to create the NS string on the fly and call it the key. Oh, I'm sorry, the name, of course. So that's one. And another one will look just the same, but now I want to encode a float value because I, my expected race is a float. And the key will be, well, nothing fancy, expected race. Now the key is just a key. I can use any string here. The important thing is when I'm going to load, I have to use the same keys because this is the key I'm going to reference. So I can just write anything here but so to make it simpler, I'm going to use the same name as my variable. So this method will be called anytime something in my application tries to encode a person. And it will successfully encode a person and convert all those uh, values of the name and expected race into a series of bytes. And this is still useless because encoding is fine, but I need to decode that at some point. And the place I'm going to decode it at is the same class. Because if I want to decode, that means I want to get that data from the series of, of uh, ones and zeros, get those names and expected race, and apply them to myself, to the object I'm inside now. So I need to implement another method which will return an ID, meaning it will return itself, actually. It will return an object, which is self. And that method called init with coder. And I'm using a decoder now for the coder, because this time I'm going to decode my stuff. But again, this is just a name. I could use anything here. So <clears throat> here is the thing. If I created my person class and I inherited from some other class and that other class supports archiving, then I should have been calling the encode, in this case, of my super class, something like super encode with, with coder and just pass it the same coder so that my superclass is being encoded first and then 
I am going to be encoded. And I should have done the same here. If I start encoding, I should first ask my parent to encode itself and then encode my stuff. This is what you're going to do if you have a class which supports archiving and then you create a subclass of that. You should always call the parent because something in inside you is from your parent. Now, that sounded really bad, but uh, in this case, we have an exception because we are inherited from NS object and NS object does not support those things. NS object is too generic to support those things. So we're not calling a super, but we still have to initialize. Now, why? Because if we are encoding from a series of ones and zeros, that means we're basically creating another person because the person we are at right now is lost. So we are going to create a new person and get the name and get the data of expected race from the coder. That means we still have to initialize this the same way we initialized our class right here in the actual designated initializer. So now all I have to do is get the stuff from, uh, from the coder. So in the same way, I'm going to ask if that was successful, if self is something, it's not null, then I get my the name to be able, uh, I'm sorry, to be equal to a decoder and decode object for key and pass that key, this one, the name. So this thing will get the data by the key of the name. And since here we saved the name, it will be here. So we will be able to load it in an instance variable and do the same with expected race. That will be a decoder, decode, of course, float for key and the key is expected race. And of course, we should return ourselves. So now we have implemented archiving. And if at some point in our application, something tries to encode or decode a person object, those methods will be called. In other words, if somewhere in our application, this is called and this object is an instance of person class, then one of those two methods will be called. So decoding is the same way. Uh, we could decode for key and for uh, a primitive, and I just showed you how to do that. So uh, this is actually what we just did, decoding a person, and here we have it. So this is module one, and if we write just this code and run our application, we won't see any difference whatsoever. So I'm not going to, to run it because there is nothing changed. But we have this ability to archive and we will use it because we want to archive and save it into a file. And this is what we're gonna do in module two. Hello, welcome back, this is module two. Let's go on to saving and loading stuff. Before we talk about saving and loading, let's talk about how our document-based application looks like. So we have that NS document. We actually created a subclass of that NS document and we just called it document. It was actually called document by default because we created a default document-based application. So the NS document the NS document controller and NS window controller are those classes that provide us with a lot of functionality we need. So the most common stuff that you can imagine with most document-based applications are there. Stuff like saving, loading, undoing, 
working with multiple documents, etc. Most of that stuff we have already implemented and provided for us in this framework. We only have to write something specific to our application. So if you look inside your project, in the supporting files, we have the info uh, P list. In our case, well, before Xcode 4.1, I, I think it was just called info, info .p list. And now we have uh, the name of our application added. Well, of course, we can change this name. So this is a, a file that describes the types of objects, the types of documents, I'm sorry, our application is going to use. It also has a lot of uh, other information that our application uses and uh, stuff like the version of the operating system that this is supposed to work with, the icon for our application and for the files, the, uh, the extension of the file that our application will save and load and copyrights, stuff like that. So technical information for your application. So that thing and the NS document controller takes care of most common operations with files like new, create a new file or save file. So most of the time we don't even worry about stuff like this and we don't really talk to NS document controller ourselves. Most of the common stuff and if you're not creating something super fancy, uh, it's already there. But if you really need to call the NS document controller, then this is the code to get to it. You have to create a pointer to a new NS document controller and then get the current document controller for your application while it runs. So if you created an application which is document based, then you could do something like this and then call the DC. Uh, this will be your document controller. The NS document is the main class that represents a document. And we created the document class right here. We have this document, document H and document M, of course. Remember, we had a document which used an array to save and to actually use as the source of information. And then to talk to that array, we created a array, an SRA controller. So NS document is that thing that uh, we uh, use and instances of subclasses of NS document are used in our application. We also have that NS window controller, but this is something we won't touch for a few weeks at least because, uh, again, uh, we have everything for common tasks there and uh, for more custom stuff, we will look into, into it, but not now to make it simpler. So if you want your document to be able to save and actually save in three different ways, to save, save all, documents if you have more than one document in your application open and save as, meaning save it as a different file, then you have to implement at least one of those methods. A first method is data of type error. And that method returns an NS data, a pointer of NS data, of course. And basically this method converts your document into series of bytes, just like archiving. If you decide to save your files as sa in some file format, not just series of bytes, then you should implement the second method. It returns an NS file wrapper, and it basically some type of a file. And if you want your file to be saved to some URL, which could be remote or could be local, uh, it could be still the, a file in your file system just referenced as a URL, then you should implement this third method. So those first two methods return the actual stuff that should be returned. So in this case, it should be a series of bytes, and in this case, it should be a file wrapper. But if something went bad and you, you are not able to save your 
file as supposed to, then those two should return nil. This one doesn't return the URL uh, because it actually tries to save it to that URL. But if something went wrong, it should return no. Remember, we have booleans with, which are weird in this language. They're not true or false, they're yes and no. And uh, I suppose that was because there wasn't a Boolean type when this language was created and subclass from C, so we have yes and no. So if something went bad, it should return no, and if the saving was successful, it should return yes. You see, all of those methods have another, some, uh, another argument passed to it, which is an error, and it's always NS error. NS error is a class which represents a, uh, of course, an error. And the idea here is kind of funky. You should provide your method with a pointer to an error, which will be used if an error is present. So we are not talking about errors in this lecture, and we in this lecture we're just doing everything solid so that there are no errors possible. But in the following lectures, we're going to work with uh, more with exceptions and errors. If you want to load your file, or in other words, if you want your application to be able to load data from a file, then you should implement the inverse of those methods. And those are the same. If you saved it as an NS data, then you should implement this one, read from data, and then it takes NS data. If you implemented the file wrapper method, then you should implement this read from file wrapper. And of course, the same with the URL. Those return yes or no uh, respectfully, uh, respectively if it's successful or not. Okay, if I want to add saving capability to my program, I need to create, so yeah, we decided to use this first one. Because, well, we implemented archiving, of course, already, and we have an ability to convert our personal object into a series of bytes. And NS data is just like that. And we just have that already in place, so let's use it. Let's save our document as a series of bytes. So, in order to do so, I need to create an NS data object and then save it into a file. To do this, we will use the NSKeyed Archiver class, which has this wonderful abstract, uh, meaning class method, archived data with, uh, with root object. And then I pass it a root object. This method archives the object into the NSData. And NSData has an object, uh, has a buffer of bytes which is just a series of bytes. So this method will return a brand new NS data. And inside that NS data, we're going to have a buffer of bytes and that buffer will represent our root object. Now it's called root object, not just object, because of the way archiving works. Remember I said, if I want to archive something, I have to archive everything inside. So if I want to archive my program, if I want to archive actually my document, the document represents, is represented by an array. So I have to encode and save an array. And that array consists of multiple person objects. So I have to encode every person object. Each person object in its place has two things to archive as well. It has a name, which is another object, and the race, which is a float, a primitive, but still needed to be archived. So when I say I want to archive my array, that will be the root object, but I have to archive everything inside there. So this is why it's called the root. This is the, the starting point of archiving, but everything inside should be archived too. So we're not archiving the array object. We are archiving everything for the root object. So let's add saving capabilities to our document. First of all, 
we want to add an outlet to our document because I want to be able to reference our uh, table view and I'm going to explain why basically I have to create a IB outlet NS table view table view and let's connect it in my application from the files owner I could just do this and I have this LTS table view now it's connected actually you might notice inside your, uh, your document H now this thing has uh, an inside circle it means this outlet is connected it, it's not useless so if I go to my document M oh yeah by the way Remember last lecture ended with an exception and I said, well, we have to think about that exception. It was actually about this. Let's just uh, recreate the same exception. So if I run my application and just close it now, uh, terminate the application, nothing will happen. It will be fine and good. If I add something and then terminate, so I go file uh, remover, quiz remover, I get this exception and this is exactly where we ended last lecture the exception is raised in data of type error method of my document and the exception is this it's there's nothing there's no code so I, I didn't have any choice the only choice I had is to create a new exception and it's called unimplemented method and it's being thrown here so the problem here is my program by default let me show you my program by default has auto saving capabilities so uh, I think it's somewhere here we have this method which is a class method in our document M auto saves in place and it returns yes this tells my application to auto save the data I have so if I close my application, nothing will happen. It won't say you have unsaved file. It would just go, but actually save the data. And if I load my file, it will load the data. This thing is added in uh, OS X Lion. And it's kind of cool because now you don't actually have to worry to, uh, about saving your files and losing your stuff. It tries to auto-save everything as much as possible. So it's wonderful, but our application does not know how to save. So when I created this new entry just now and then tried to terminate the application, it tried to auto-save my stuff because I was exiting. But I don't have the code to save. I'm going to write it now, but I didn't have it. And by default, it tries to raise an exception. So let's do it. Let's add saving to our application. So since we chose to use the first method, saving into a series of bytes, uh, and that series, the buffer of bytes, is inside an NSData object, this is the method we're going to use. So we already have it. This is where the exception was thrown. So I don't need this code because now I, I want to actually put the stuff uh, to save my data so let's delete this and the first thing I want to do is uh, tell my table view I am ending editing so that's why I created the outlet I say table view window and editing for nil so we just need this because uh, we're going to save and I don't want to edit while I'm saving. So now the only thing I have to do is return some NS data. And we don't have to create NS data, just like I said, we can use this wonderful NS keyed archiver. And it has a method called archive data archived data with root object 
and the object we want to save is the array of our employees and it's called employees. This is array of persons. So now we will be able to save our uh, archive, our uh, persons. So uh, let's go back to slides and go on to doing something else. And that something else is of course loading. This is the exact the same uh, exact same idea. Now with arch with archiving we needed to decode and now we have to encode. And with saving we have to save and then we have to load. And we have uh, the same approach. We are going to use NSKID unarchiver and it has a method unarchive object with data. And we're going to use some uh, same NS data. So our document has this method and it's right after this data of type error, it's read from data uh, of type error. And again, we, we have this default code and it just raises an exception because we don't have uh, the actual loading mechanism implemented. So let's, let's try our loading. Loading is a bit trickier, but it's still straightforward. Uh, I'm going to load a new array from uh, the series of bytes which is inside NSData's um, buffer. So I want to create a new NS mutable array. Uh, array and just call it new array. Make it nil by default so we don't have anything, it's just an empty pointer. And now let's try to load. So let's try to assign the new array to NS keyed unarchiver. And the method we're going to uh, to call is unarchive object with data and that data. So this is the data that we got and this is instance of NS data. Now we're using try and catch statement because loading and loading from series of bytes is dangerous. That series of bytes could be corrupted and then we won't be able uh, to get it. So we have to try and if it didn't succeed then we're going to catch some exception. And this would be an instance of NS exception of course. So a pointer E. And here we have to do something. Uh, we have to uh, describe the nature of our exception in a formal way. Uh, so let's do everything we expected to do. Let's create a new NS dictionary. And this is just to describe an exception. This is, this is not really too important for the file loading itself. So uh, just create a new NS dictionary, uh, dictionary with object uh, and the object will be just a string uh, that will say the data is uh, let's say corrupted just some and the key will be ns localized failure reason error key so that that's the one used in the system and we should use it as well then we have this out error here. So this is the pointer to a pointer where we have a NS error. And uh, oh yeah, we should do this is if we have an out error. So uh, this is the catch statement. And here we should say if out error is provided, if we have this pointer, then we should create this proper exception and then assign it let's say out error equals ns error error with the main ns os status error domain and code will be unimplemented error and user info is that dictionary 
Okay, so if we actually caught this exception, that means we didn't didn't uh, read the data from the file, so we should return no. If that catch wasn't in place, then this line was successful, meaning now we have the data loaded inside our new array. And inside our, uh, our document, we had set employees method, which just took an array and add, uh, used that array as the employees, to, so it replaced the employees. Uh, so we can call self set employees and pass it the new array. And this still expects us to return the status. So it was successful by this time and we should say return yes. So let's go over this one more time because this is, this is important. This method was used to save the data and all we have to, all we had to do is create a method create actually just a line in already created method that returns the ns data and inside that ns data we have all the data we need this is loading and we created a new array and then tried to take the stuff from our ns data which is here data put it in a new array and then call set employees and set employees if we actually look for it we have this method it takes an array and does everything we need so that employees is now equal to this array so now if I run my application I will be able to save and load stuff so let's try this will be me and I'm going to put myself just the 90% race and this will be some some Felix J and we'll just make it 30% so now if I go to file and save I will be able to just save this and call it test so now if I uh, go to my desktop where I saved it I have this test file and if I right click and just try to open it with I don't know just text edit I will see garbage uh, because this is a bytecode this is not something readable by uh, a person so we have yes person ns objects some, some stuff and uh, those those values but the important thing is i can quit and run again and open that file and hopefully we will be able to load stuff so i have my desktop with a test and here, I have the, the, the data. So this is the document-based application, meaning I can work with multiple documents. So I can create a new one by hitting Command N or just go File New. And each of those I can save to different files. So the second window appeared because I, I was having this first window and this is another document. And if I decided to load a file, I'm loading it into an, another document. I'm actually just opening that document. This is how I see it. And I still have this document and it's not saved. So I can close those. So that was easy. All we had to do is to provide it with a way of saving and tell what to save and everything else, files, uh, converting into NS data, converting into series of ones and zeros, that was in place. So one last thing I want to tell you about is uh, the curious but smart way how 
the OS 10 application looks like. So if I just go to my application folder here, let's just close Xcode. I have all those applications. And if you're not too familiar with the OS 10, uh, one thing which is kind of not obvious if you're coming to this, uh, to this operating system after Windows is the way you installing applications. The way you installing applications in Windows is complicated. You run the installer, it does something, it copies a lot of the files, and from the point of view of a programmer, it's even worse. It writes a lot of the stuff in some uh, registry, it saves a lot of the files inside system directories and its, its own directory and a lot of the links and stuff like that, and then it finally has some executable file you can run, and then you have a link to that executable file on your desktop, and that's just a mess. In OS X, it's much simpler and smarter. The application you see in your application folder is actually everything you have about this application. Yes, you still have some sometimes some folders um, that are used b by your application, but most of the applications, good ones at least, have everything they need inside that one thing. So uh, here I have, let's just open this. Uh, oh, sorry, this is documents. Open applications. I have those applications installed. Uh, and the way I installed it is, well, I just copied this thing inside my applications folder. So if I go to uh, something like this application, this is everything I have. But this is, if I run it, it looks like this is an executable. But actually, this is a folder, and I have everything about this application inside that folder. And I can show the contents of that package or that folder if I click like this. And I have the contents folder here. And here, I actually have everything about my application. Well, in this folder, macOS, I actually have all the executables. Sometimes an application has more than one, but in this case, there are two. Here's the plist file, and this is that file I showed you in the module one. This is the file that describes your application, the version, the copyright information, the icons used, the extensions used, etc. So this is that uh, this uh, that file, and there are different directories here, like the framework and plugins. Important one is resources. This is where all those images and movies and sounds basically all the resources you used when you were developing your application are now here. And this is a smart way of doing it because, well, when user gets your application, it doesn't want to, sh he doesn't or she doesn't want to know about all those files and resources and plugins and stuff. They just want your application. So uh, when you create an application and you want to check those files inside, you can just go onto uh, your terminal and get inside that as a folder, because it is a folder, but if you just run it, it will run as an application. So that's it for this lecture, and I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.